I'm Kurmi Mori in Tokyo, and this is Quick Take Geo. Hong Kong's pro democracy opposition resign en masse. Is this the most concrete example yet of the United States' failure to change China's behavior? This is it, guys. The PlayStation is 5 it, is finally here, setting up a battle of the consoles against the Xbox Series X. He's known as the father of the PlayStation. Ken Kutaragi has now turned to robotics. Find out why he's doing it all for no pay. Plus, we meet the Thai researcher who created a new strain of rice. She wants to help the country take back its spot as the world's biggest rice exporter. Governments, including the US, UK, and Australia, have condemned China's new loyalty rules for Hong Kong. Beijing passed a resolution on Wednesday allowing any lawmaker who is not deemed loyal enough to be disqualified. Four legislators were dismissed, and other pro democracy politicians resigned in protest. Fifteen remaining opposition members in Hong Kong's Legislative Council have announced that they would resign en masse in solidarity with their colleagues. We will submit our resignation letter to the uh, uh, Legislative Council uh, Secretary. And um, uh, we just want to thank for Hong Kong people's support for so long. And we will keep fighting for Hong Kong uh, democracy. Joining me now is Bloomberg reporter Ian Marlowe in Hong Kong. Ian, where exactly are you in Hong Kong for us? Yeah, I'm just outside of the Legislative Council Chamber in uh, central Hong Kong. Uh, this was the area where uh, thousands of protesters gathered at the height of the protest and actually broke inside the chamber, causing a ruckus inside there to protest the extradition bill that set off uh, Hong Kong's historic protests this summer. So talk us through what's happening there now. Why did all of Hong Kong's opposition resign this week? China imposed new rules uh, that allowed the Hong Kong government to expel any legislative council lawmakers that they deemed insufficiently patriotic. And uh, the Hong Kong government immediately moved to uh, eject four lawmakers, triggering the mass resignation of the entire uh, political opposition here in Hong Kong, which leaves no pro-democracy politicians in the apex democratic institution uh, of Hong Kong. I think you're walking right where a lot of the protesters were last year. Why have they stopped now? Yeah, it's basically been a combination of two main factors. One is the national security law that had pretty strict punishments, including uh, life sentences in jail. Uh, for anyone convicted of, of violating that, that law, which includes uh, sort of vague and uh, in, in some cases nebulous charges like uh, inciting hatred against the Chinese government, advocating for uh, political independence in Hong Kong. At the pandemic, the, the government imposed really strict uh, gathering restrictions, so you couldn't gather with you know more than four people at one time. So any protesters who gathered were quickly uh, arrested and charged under those rules. So some are probably wondering, isn't Hong Kong part of China anyway? So then why all this tension? Yeah, Hong Kong's uh, democratic situation has always been quite tense. You've got, you know, ostensibly a democracy existing, uh, you know, sort of on the edge of China. It, it has some democratic freedoms. There are elections here, but the, the, the more fully democratic votes are for lower levels of office. And the Legislative Council chamber uh, behind me actually is not fully democratic. And then uh, you have the chief executive handpicked by China and then voted among by a sort of select group of, of elites here in Hong Kong. And China has been strengthening its hold on Hong Kong uh, over the past year. And uh, these new measures that were rolled out this week, these are things that are pulling Hong Kong much closer uh, to mainland China and making the political system uh, you know, much, much closer to, to what we have uh, in, in mainland China. Ian, and I know you're walking outside of Lejko right now. Where exactly are you? It does look like you're in some sort of cage, but has that always been up that wall there? This is a, a, a footbridge over a major uh, highway in central Hong Kong, right outside of the legislature. And uh, the, these, these grates were put up across a lot of different uh, bridges in Hong Kong 
uh, over over the course of the protests because protesters found a very successful tactic where they would just set up camp on a bridge and then throw things onto the the roads below and they did that basically uh you know bringing the daily commute to a close uh and causing a lot of uh havoc so then looking ahead what does the future hold for the people of hong kong a lot of people that we speak to are kind of viewing hong kong's long-term political future as one where china slowly chips away at the freedoms that that make hong kong uh, unique uh, the freedom of the press, the freedom of assembly, uh, freedom of speech. I think we're getting to a point where Hong Kong very much more closely resembles Chinese cities on the mainland. I think a lot of y young people here in particular are quite, you know, quite frustrated, sad, and, and feel hopeless about that, about that trajectory. Um, and a lot of people have started to leave uh, or think about leaving. Uh, there's been people leaving to Taiwan or claiming asylum in the UK. Unfortunately, it's, it's not necessarily a, a, a rosy picture in the sense that I think we're getting to a point where um, a lot of people feel afraid to uh, speak up and speak out about some of the issues that they've, they've long held uh, dear. Uh, you know, the, the main one, of course, is, which is the, the push for democracy and greater, uh, greater voting power here in Hong Kong. The relatives of 12 Hong Kong protesters detained in August say they have still not heard from them. They were stopped by the Chinese Coast Guard while attempting to flee to Taiwan in a boat. Rosalie E. Silva has more. Lu Chi Man was arrested on a boat with 11 other pro democracy activists. Some have been charged with offenses such as arson rioting, and possession of offensive weapons. They were heading to Taiwan when they were intercepted off the coast of Hong Kong. China's accusing them of organizing or participating in an illegal border crossing. Come the Chinese authorities have appointed two legal representatives to each of the 12 activists. The families want the group to be tried in Hong Kong. The first thing is they have to face up to the consequences of that uh, offense in that particular jurisdiction, that is a mainland jurisdiction. And thereafter, of course, we will have arrangements to bring them back to face their criminal liabilities in Hong Kong. Activists Eddie Chu and Owen Chow are trying to help the detainees' families. Uh, 
。當然，無論係深圳公安、誒看守所或者特區政府都有啲講法，譬如話佢哋啊健康情況良好啊之類。但係呢啲所有講法都冇辦法係經過由家屬委託嘅律師去核實啦，而誒家屬本人都冇機會係誒同呢啲被扣留人士去通電話咯。喺呢一件事上面，其實香港人第一個感覺就係當日。反送中呢一個嘅舉動，呢一個行動，呢個抗爭係正確嘅，因為今日正正擺喺香港人面前，就係香港人被送中之後，我哋接收到嘅資訊基本上就係零，我哋亦都唔知道官派律師嘅情況係幾時會出現，任何一個家屬委託嘅律師都唔能夠面見到當事人，呢一個就係喺中國入面司法制度帶俾香港人嘅當中嘅恐懼。所以我諗呢一個香港人就係會感受係比比較係深切嘅。Lin Chi Lei is one of the Chinese lawyers hired by the detainee's families. 港十二人案件雖然罪名是偷越國邊境罪，但是在這個特定的環境下，這個目前這個港十二人案件應該是目前中國大陸。最为敏感，政治意味更浓的一个案件。同时，因为我知道有一些律师，呃，受到压力，呃，都退出了这个辩护，所以，呃，也需要一些律师继续走下去。所以当时，呃，虽然我也知道这个案件会非常敏感，呃，但是，我认为作为律师。去代理这样的案件，是完全符合大陆的法律法规规定的。我们呃半天的时间都在看守所的大门口，等于在那里看守所的人员接待我们。他们的理由就是说，当事人已经有了两个律师，那么他又拒不告诉这个两个律师的名字，也不让我们去会见当事人，对这个。官派律师进行确认，所以说这个一定是违法的。他们 Some of the detainees may face up to seven years in Chinese prison. Women leaders were actually better at controlling the deaths from COVID-19. Do you think out of this pandemic? We'll see more countries be willing to elect female leaders. When we look at women leaders, we tend to project on them baggage that they shouldn't bear. Women are given an opportunity when no one else wants to do the job. Women had a very clear objective.、Uh, they wanted to save lives. The women leaders, if you look at their careers, have also built up a level of, of trust. In fact. Women have to be better at communication in order to be elected、uh, as leaders, whereas this doesn't hold true for men. We need to get those sexist stereotypes out of our head and give women a fair run for leadership. Trying to change the stereotypes about women is not only the business of women, but men have to be part of it. Is it your expectation to do this another five, ten, fifteen years? It's like Whole Foods is my daughter, and I literally married my daughter off to the richest man in the world. I just kind of came along to to make sure the marriage settled in well. PlayStation 5 is here. Sony isn't selling them in stores due to the pandemic, so some gamers ordered the PS5 online, and the lucky few started getting them shipped to their homes today. Wow! Joining me now is Sarah Kan Toto, founder of gaming industry consultancy Kanthan Games in Tokyo. 
Sarah Ken, what's the buzz all about? What makes this console special? Yeah, so this week is huge for the game business overall because millions and millions of people uh, have been waiting worldwide uh, for the launch of the PlayStation 5. So it's now today, it's seven years after the launch of the PlayStation 4 in 2013, and we are finally at the start of the next generation of um, uh, video game consoles. Uh, so it's the first time in history also that new machines, including the PlayStation 5, are launching dur during a, glo a global pandemic. Uh, the PlayStation 5 is a key product for Sony um, and a key product also for the gaming industry in general um, for the next seven, eight, maybe even nine years. Um, and my personal expectation is that the PlayStation 5 is going to be a super hit for uh, Sony. And have you had a chance to play it yourself yet? Not yet. So uh, uh, I'm, I was trying to get one on uh, on you know the the typical uh, the typical uh, online sites that we have here in Japan. Uh, I wasn't able to get one. Uh, the the demand is just off the charts. But I already invited myself to a friend uh, later tonight uh, <laughs> to try the PlayStation Five uh, at uh, at his home. And what are you looking forward to the most? I've been hearing a lot about the controller, Dual Sense, how it feels a little bit different. Is that one of the things that you're looking forward to? Yes. So the controller is actually a big deal. So with the controller, uh, you know, after a long, long time, uh, Sony brings real innovation to the table because of its uh, several features. Like for example, you know, when you want to shoot your friend in the game, and in the game, you know, your uh, weapon jams, you will be able to feel it in the real world because the trigger on the controller is going to be blocked. Um, um, so, uh, so Sony is trying, you know, new things with the controller. Uh, with the controller, but I look most forward to the exclusive games that uh, Sony has in store for the PlayStation Five. So, seven years ago, you mentioned that's when the PS4 launched. Everybody was talking about whether smartphones would replace consoles. We know that didn't exactly happen. What are some of the biggest industry trends you're looking at today? Yeah, so smartphone gaming is still really, really big. So mobile gaming has become only bigger since uh, since 2013. But uh, you know, the video game industry has been able to uh, sustain itself. It has been it was very, very stable over the last uh, couple of years uh, because I think that mobile gaming and uh, video gaming um, are different beasts. So these are different markets. And in terms of industry trends, I think that the focus is really now on the next generation uh, console war that, uh, that, start, uh, that is starting this week and the role that Nintendo is going to play in all of this over the next uh, four or five, six years. And can you talk a little bit about the game lineup? Microsoft has their subscription service, kind of like the Netflix of games, but Sony doesn't. Is that attractive to you, the subscription model? Uh, yeah, I think that the subscription model is attractive to almost every gamer because of the a very attractive price point. Uh, so just for a, a, a few dollars every month, you get access to a wealth of uh, video games. It's almost too much, you can argue. Uh, Sony is going the other way. Sony is uh, keeping it more traditional. Sony has a similar service called PlayStation Now but it's not as uh, strong as Game Pass, I would say. So Sony is still trying to uh, sell uh, games individually to, uh, to people for 60 or $70 per piece. It's a different philosophy. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft just launched the Xbox Series X this week. The holiday season's coming up. Which one should we get, the Xbox or the PS5? My my recommendation would be the PlayStation 5 because of the stronger lineup uh, of games. So Microsoft uh, doesn't really have a single hit title. I have to say it like that. Doesn't really have a single uh, block, exclusive blockbuster a blockbuster game at launch. They had one uh, planned. It's called Halo Infinite. It's a, a sci-fi first-person shooter, but uh, that one got delayed uh, to 2021. So my recommendation would be uh, try to get a Sony PlayStation 5. PlayStation has become a household name, but do you know the man behind the iconic console? We spoke to the father of PlayStation himself. なぜ私がこの分野に入ってきたかというと、基本的に私はイノベーションが大好きだということです。で、この会社っていうのはまユニークな会社で、実は二つの研究開発を行っています。Genkutaragi wants to make affordable robots to work alongside humans. Kongo 
こなすという中で、やはりあのセーフティーということはとっても大事になってくるクタラキ is doing all of this for no pay. まあ、これはあの今まで、えー、どうしてもロボットっていうのは固定したものだったわけですがこれからあのさっきお話したように自動運転の車に動き回るわけですよねそれと同時に工場の中だとさまざまなモビリティシステム例えば台車であるとかそれから人間であるとか,なんか部品の移動であるとかコンベヤーであるとかいろんなものが動き回ってるわけですねでそれらを統合的にセンシングして統合的にまああのまあ認識して最適になるようなまあ整備をするもしくは何か突発的な動きがあった場合にはそれを避けるためにあのそこの領域を例えばスローダウンするであるとか止めるであるとか。COVID-19 has also shown a real need for robots. 今今我々例えばあのコロナの時代にいてで家で例えばリモートで仕事をする家にいていろいろ食事をするとなると今まで以上にいろいろな物流が、まあ、必要になってきてその部分については、まあ、本当に今エッセンシャルワーカーの方が一生懸命働いておられるという状態であるしでも工場は24時間稼働できないわけですよねで物流も24時間稼働できない、まあ、そういった環境においてロボットと人間が協調できるような新たなファブリケーションを考えると、まあ、24時間安全に駆動できるようなそういったあの生産物流関係が実現できるものと考えています。You have to think about all the other offsets、uh, to、uh, tax. And so we're looking at it. I think we're going to be prepared.、Um, and you know, we're modeling out a whole bunch of different scenarios.、Uh, I think we're going to be well positioned no matter what the outcome is. Our biggest initiative yet is coming up. On October 29th, we'll start a $20 billion rural digital opportunity fund auction, essentially targeting that money to unserved parts of the country where there is no broadband at the FCC's definition of 25 megabit per second. Is it your expectation to do this another 5, 10, 15 years? It's like Whole Foods is my daughter, and I literally married my daughter off to the richest man in the world. I just kind of came along to, to make sure the marriage settled in well. Used to be the world's largest rice exporter, but it lost that top spot to India and Vietnam. Many Asian consumers are finding Thai rice a bit too hard to love, so the country came up with its own soft variety. Bloomberg's Randy Tang Tang Knight met the researcher who created the new strain. Take a look. What? Thailand is betting on a new softer variety of rice to save the future of its exports. Thailand is one of the world's biggest rice exporters, responsible for about one fifth of the global rice exports. It was, in fact, the world's biggest rice exporter for three decades from the early 1980s, but in recent years, it started losing some of its market share to rival exporters like Vietnam, and that's because it lacks the kind of soft rice varieties that are being offered by its competitors. 
At the forefront of Thailand's new softer rice frontier is a variety developed by Shun Shom Di Rasami called RD79. Shun Shom started with two parent rice strains with distinct characteristics that she wanted her new rice to have. It took more than 10 years from the start of Shuan Shom's research to getting the strain approved and for farmers to start planting. The industry is now pushing for more farmers to start growing softer varieties so that the country could export more and get more people back on its rice. More than half of the world's population consume rice regularly as part of their diet. For Thailand though, rice isn't just central to its cuisine. It's the country's most important crop, one that supports about a quarter of Thai households. About half of Thai farmlands are dedicated to its production, and nearly half of rice output is exported, earning the country the nickname the Rice Bowl of Asia. Randy joins me now from Bangkok. Randy, how bad is Thailand's rice industry? In recent years, Thai rice exports have become more expensive than those from rival exporters, making it hard for the country to stay competitive. There has also been severe drought this year that has cut its output and made its rice even more costlier than other exporting nations. And if you take these short-term problems like drought and strong currency out of the equation, the key issue that the industry has at its core is that for the past few decades, there have not been a lot of efforts to improve the strains of rice that are grown here. And that's really the key issue that's affecting its competitiveness. While rival exporters keep coming up with newer strains that have better texture and have higher yields, Thai rice stays pretty much the same over the past few decades. So um, the Thai rice exports industry is facing a lot of problems from its rice being too expensive to not having enough varieties to complete to compete globally. It sounds like the industry is really struggling, but who has been affected the most? Right now, exporters may seem like the most affected group because they can export less, but the Thai rice industry is heavily reliant on exports. So when exporters can't sell, that will also affect the millers and the farmers as well. Um, the Thai Rice Exporters Association expects its shipments for 2020 to be around 6 to 6.5 million tons. And that's about 15 to 20 percent lower than the previous year. And that is the lowest in two decades. Um, the exporters also view that if Thailand doesn't increase its production of the kind of softer rice varieties that are currently in demand, it could further slip down the ranking among top global rice exporters. Yeah, we just saw that video on the soft rice, that new strain. Have you tried RD79? What's it like? No, unfortunately, I have not, but I, I would love to. It's really hard to find that kind of rice at the moment. When I met up with the researcher, I asked her if she had some samples available. She didn't have it um, when she gave us a sample of unmilled rice um, to photograph, but we, we couldn't eat that. So um, I didn't get to try them, but um, I've been speaking to several people who have tried it and they all say that they could really feel that it's much softer than um, regular Thai rice. The level of softness is similar to that of Thai jasmine rice, um, but without the distinct, distinct fragrance. The rice researchers are now trying to come up with newer strains that can do everything from being high yields uh, to having soft texture and having that fragrant smell. So, and that could be um, the perfect rice specimen for the future. Thanks for watching this episode of Quick Take Geo. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Quick Take for all the latest news.